this experiment focuses on using and utilizing the periodic table. The periodic table is a listing of all of the known elements. You have pre-transition, transition, post-transition, post and rare earth elements all combined in a single table. The activity looks at the different values that are associated with the individual elements, as well as other trends that you can find on the periodic table itself. The periodic table displays the elements in a way where you can easily identify the different properties and trends within the table, as well as the different components of the individual uh, elements. Elements themselves are specific where atoms are more general. An element is a unique atom. Atoms themselves are basically the foundation of chemistry. Absolutely everything is made up of different atoms. So while one atom can exist by itself, all different types of molecules, as well as other physical things, are made up of all of these atoms. One molecule of ethanol contains nine different atoms while one molecule of the protein insulin contains 788 different atoms. Atoms themselves have three components within them, uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons are found in the nucleus or the center of the atom and these have a positive charge associated with it. The number of protons is what dictates the element. Uh, elements themselves have a unique number of protons. Any atom with a proton with only one proton is hydrogen. Any atom with two protons is helium. So by changing the number of protons, you're changing the element itself. Neutrons are also found in the nucleus uh, of an atom, and these have a neutral charge. And when you change the number of neutrons, as long as the number of protons is constant, so it's the same element, the number of neutrons can vary. So in the case of carbon, carbon has six protons and usually six neutrons as well, but it can also exist with seven neutrons or even eight neutrons, all still being carbon, but a little different. Uh, these elements or these different number of neutrons in elements are called isotopes, and these will be touched on uh, a little bit later. The last component of an atom is uh, an, the electrons, and these are found outside of the nucleus, where the protons are ne and neutrons are condensed in the center. The electrons are surrounding that nucleus. Electrons themselves are negatively charged, so they balance with the protons. In a neutral, uh, neutral atom, straight from the uh, neutral element, straight from the periodic table, the number of protons and electrons are the same. However, Electrons can move around. This is where the actual chemistry happens, is moving electrons between different atoms. That's how chemical reactions take place. And you, an atom can exist that has w one extra electron. Overall, if it was neutral and you added one negatively charged electron, 
the whole charge would be negative. Likewise, you could also take an electron away, and now there would be too few electrons to balance out with the positive protons, and the overall atom would have a positive charge. These elements with differing numbers of electrons are called ions, and those will also be touched on in a little bit. So on the periodic table, uh, it's arranged in such a way that you can see properties and the most basic uh, values from the periodic table exist in almost uh, all of them. While many periodic tables can list other uh, numerical values or properties, pretty much every single one would have these three components, the atomic symbol, the atomic number, and the atomic mass. The atomic symbol is just the abbreviation for the element, a one or two letter abbreviation. Um, the, if it's one letter, it will always be the capital letter. If it's two letters, the first letter is capitalized and the second letter is lower cased. It must be lower cased because some of these uh, elements have only one letter abbreviations. And if they're, if you two lettered abbreviation has them both capitalized, it could be mistaken for two separate elements. You'll notice when you go through the periodic table that not all of the atomic symbols make sense. Uh, having letters and things that don't even appear in the name of the compound. This is because some of them are using the symbol based on a previous name, either in a different language or uh, Latin or something that used to be more common in use but no longer is. The atomic number is the numbering scale for the periodic table, one, two, three, four, five. So as I had mentioned, anything or any element with uh, a number of protons as one is hydrogen. This is the atomic number of hydrogen. The atomic number of helium is two and has two protons. So as the periodic table uh, takes shape, the atomic number is continually increasing and that dictates how many protons and electrons are found in the element itself. The last value typically on a periodic table is the atomic mass or the average atomic mass. This is the number in grams that is used or that is needed to make up one mole of atoms. And one mole is just 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. That is, a, a mole is the name of a number. Just like one dozen is 12, one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Atoms and elements are so small that you need to include a lot of them when uh, working in the real world. There are a lot of elements, there are a lot of atoms that are contained in uh, one gram of anything. And chemistry occurs using this unit, the unit of a mole. So here is the periodic table itself. It's shaped in a way where the different elements are grouped in different sections. The columns are referred to as element groups, while the rows are referred to as periods. The elements listed in an atomic group usually have similar characteristics. Um, so there, 
the different groupings are in this middle area that has kind of uh, separation between the left and right is the transition metals, very appropriately named before the transition metals on the left hand side are the pre-transition elements, the post-transition elements after the transition elements, and uh, rare earth elements. Now, in these pre-transition elements, the individual groups have specific names. So the first group is the alkali metals, and the second group is the alkaline earth metals. These are all metallic uh, elements and are typically pretty reactive. The alkali metals are extremely reactive, even exploding if you drop them in water. The alkaline earth metals are more tame, but still can be moderately uh, reactive. The transition metals are in the center of the periodic table, and they have some different properties, different unique properties. They're uh, very conductive, they're typically rather dense, um, and these types of atoms, these transition elements, can have multiple different versions of their ions, or varying numbers of electrons. The rare earth elements are usually shown below the periodic table. However, in many older versions of the periodic table, you will see it stretched out. These two rows actually appear right here in between the pre-transition elements and the transition elements. However, that extends the periodic table to be very, very long. So most times they're typically uh, shown as a subset or underneath the, the rest of the periodic table. The top row is referred to as the lanthanides just because in reference to the fact that the first element is lanth uh, lanthium and the bottom row is referred to as the actinides. Again, because the first element in that row is actinium. Now, a lot of these elements in the rare earth elements are radioactive, and many of them are even man-made. Uranium, element number 92, is the heaviest naturally occurring element that's currently known. All of these other elements past uranium, all of these heavier elements are man-made. They're synthesized through nuclear chemistry by combining protons to create new elements. The post-transition elements occur on the right-hand side of the transition metals. And these elements are both metal and nonmetal. The transition between them is this stepwise line cutting the, this block in half. The lower left are all metallic elements, and the upper right are all nonmetal elements. Those that kind of straddle this line are, they many times referred to as metalloids. They can have properties similar to either a metal or a nonmetal. Group 18, this very last group, is many times referred to as the noble gases. They are all at room temperature, they are all in the gas state, and they are very, very non-reactive. They are perfectly happy as they are and very incredibly stable. So they've always kind of been referred to as the noble gases. Uh, group 17 is also referred to as the halogens. These are things fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and 
they would make uh, things like chloride for sodium chloride, fluoride that's in tap water or that the dentist will put on your teeth. Uh, and they have, again, each group has a set of properties that are kind of unique for these individual groupings. As mentioned previously, you can have an, an element with varying numbers of neutrons, and these are referred to as isotopes. And these are where the atomic mass comes from. So each proton and neutron weighs approximately the same amount. They each weigh 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. They're very, very light. Um, and this amount is approximately equal to, uh, if you multiply this by Avogadro's number for one mole, this is approximately, approximately equal to one gram. So, it would take one gram to contain one mole of either protons or neutrons. So these are referred to as AMU, atomic mass units. And this is uh, the unit that's in the atomic mass on the periodic table. So in the case of carbon, carbon has three different isotopes. Carbon-12, which has six protons and six neutrons. Six plus six is 12. And it's a, an abundance of 98.93%. So the amount of carbon present is 98.93% all this kind. There is a trace amount of carbon-13. This has six protons and seven neutrons, so a total mass of 13 atomic mass units. And this only has an abundance of a little over 1%, 1.07%. The last isotope of carbon that can exist is carbon-14 with six protons and eight neutrons with an atomic mass of 14. This one, however, has a, an abundance of zero. This is because carbon-14 is radioactive. And when, if ever it exists, it breaks down and reverts back to one of the others. To calculate an average atomic mass, you need the atomic mass of the individual isotope and its relative abundance. So you're taking these and multiplying them together and adding them up. In the case of carbon-12, uh, it weighs 12 atomic mass units and 98.93% of all carbon is carbon-12. So you multiply 12 by 98.93%. Carbon-13 has an abundance of 1.07%. So you multiply those together as well. And then you add them up. And this will give you 12.0107 AMU. This is the average atomic weight of carbon. This, can, this method can be used for any, uh, any element. You need to have all of the isotopes combined to figure out what is, on average, the weight that it takes or the mass that it takes to equal one mole of atoms. The last point I'm going to touch on is ions. So while isotopes are 
elements with varying numbers of neutrons, an ion is an element with varying numbers of electrons. So whenever an element undergoes a reaction, uh, typically it's always with the electrons. Nuclear chemistry refers to the nucleus and that's where the chemistry happens, but all other chemistry occurs with the electrons moving back and forth or being shared between different elements. And sometimes even completely leaving or completely attaching to a different element, creating these ions. A cation is an element that loses an electron, so it lost a negative charge. Therefore, that element now overall has a positive charge. And anion is the exact opposite. It's an element that gains an extra electron. So you're adding a negative charge and therefore the entire element becomes negative. The properties between the atoms and their elements are extremely different. Sodium is an alkali metal. It is very reactive and explodes when it touches water. Sodium metal though, or I'm sorry, sodium ion though, is very non-reactive. That's the primary component in sodium chloride or table salt that we eat and our body needs to survive. But when we put salt on our food, it does not explode. They are, while they are the same element, the difference of this one electron really makes the properties incredibly different. In the end, this activity is all about using the periodic table. You're using the table to figure out atomic name, atomic number, and atomic mass of these different elements, the names of the different portions of the periodic table, as well as other properties that the periodic table can show you. Hopefully, you can use the periodic table both in the activity and in lecture books and in other areas to determine these properties and use them throughout chemistry. The quantum properties of elements are also based on the periodic table. The quantum properties are based on the number of electrons that a specific element would have. The electrons themselves are based on the atomic number. The atomic number of the element is how many electrons that element has to work with. By moving along on the periodic table, you're changing the number of electrons. Electrons can only exist in whole numbers. Therefore, they are quantized and the energies associated with those electrons are what quantum chemistry is based on. The second half of the experiment focuses on the quantum properties of the different elements, particularly the number of electrons. Elements can only have whole numbers of electrons. You can't have an element with five and a half electrons. Therefore, the energy associated with four electrons and the energy associated with five electrons are set. You can't have an energy value that's in between uh, those numbers. It's a quantized property. When electrons uh, are subjected to energy, they increase in energy, they absorb energy, and then they release it in the form of a photon. So when an element absorbs energy, it takes it in, the electron goes up to the higher energy level, and when it 
relaxes back down to the lower energy level, it releases light. It releases light energy. And the amount of that energy exists along the electromagnetic spectrum. Depending on how much energy was absorbed by the electron and how far back down the electron relaxes, the energy that's released in the photon can vary. Um, typically, it's in the infrared, the visible, the ultraviolet range, uh, but can also be microwave or even X-ray radiation that's released when an electron relaxes. And particularly in this experiment, we're focusing on the visible region. And this is the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that's associated with color. So, color and wavelength and energy are all related. So each individual color is a unique wavelength of light that corresponds to that particular color. And since there is a specific wavelength, an actual length, that can be converted from nanometers into meters. And light can then be turned from a wavelength into a frequency. So a frequency is, if you think of a wave, going back to this image right here, you're thinking of a wave. How long it takes for it to go through one cycle. On this end of the spectrum, it's a very small frequency. All right, I'm sorry, a very large uh, frequency. It happens a lot in a given uh, amount of time. The light particle can go oscillate up and down many, many, many times versus on the other end of the spectrum in radio waves, it happens at a much slower pace. The light oscillates up and down its wavelength over a longer period of time. And that's related to the speed of light. So the, the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength in meters. That way, uh, since this, the unit of speed of light is meters per second, when you divide this by a distance, so how many meters the light travels, it gives you how many times uh, per second the light will go up and down in that wave. Finally, to convert it to energy, the energy is related to the frequency. They're directly proportional. You multiply the frequency by Planck's constant right here, and that will give you the energy associated with that photon of light in the unit of joules. So by going through these unit conversions, you can change the color or the uh, frequency and wavelength of light into the energy that's associated with it. And where this comes into play with elements and molecules is, as I mentioned, with the electrons. So electrons typically want to be at the lowest energy level possible. They always want to exert the least amount of energy. So if an outside source adds a lot of energy, the electron will absorb some of that and go up to a higher energy level. After an amount of time, usually near instantaneous, but very, very quickly, the electron will cool back down or relax down to a lower energy level. And the difference between these energy levels, this amount of energy is released as a photon. It's released as light. So it can either be light that you can see, like the visible region, or it can be light radiation that humans can't really see, like 
infrared radiation or ultraviolet radiation. And depending on what state the electron is when it starts and what it relaxes back to, these are quantized energy levels. So if an electron is at an energy level of, let's say, four, it can relax down to an energy of three for one set amount of energy, an energy of level of two, or an energy level of one. So if an electron is at the fourth energy level, it can only have three specific energies that it can release. No more, no less. Only these three values and that's it. That's why these energies are quantized and relate it to the different wavelengths of light that are released. Each electron in an atom has its own specific energy and its own set of quantum values that describes that particular energy. So there are things like the different energy level, the different sub, uh, the different orbital or subshell, and the different orbital within the subshell. And then what's referred to as the spin within the orbital itself. So as you're going through, you each one of the electrons in an, L, uh, in an atom has all four of these numbers. And an electron configuration is a way to write out all of these numbers and describe what the energy is for that particular elect electron. And then for an element, what the energy is for all of the electrons within that element. So when you're writing out electron configurations, the number out front is the energy level. And that's based on, what, in fact, all of this can be based on where the element is in the periodic table. So in the case of hydrogen, it is in the first energy level, which is just based on the period in the periodic table. The first uh, row has an energy le level of one, the second row, energy of two, three, four, and so on. The pre-transition metals have their uh, electrons in the S subshell. And each one of the S orbital, or each one of the S subshells can hold two electrons. There is one orbital within the S subshell. The post-transition elements, the electrons associated with those, or the outermost electrons associated with those, are in the P subshell. Each P subshell has three orbitals, which can hold two electrons. So the P subshell can ho hold a total of six. And the transition metals, the D subshell, can hold a total of 10 electrons. There are five different orbitals within the D subshell, each holding two electrons and for a total of 10. So when you write the electron configuration itself, you're starting with the lowest energy electron, which in every case will be hydrogen. Hydrogen, that first, that one electron at the very, very base of the atom, closest to the nucleus, all the way in there, lowest amount of energy is at the energy level of one. It's at the lowest energy subshell, which is the S subshell. And there is one electron within this S subshell. So that's how you're, you go through and write all of the electrons out within an element. What uh, energy level, what subshell, and how many electrons are in that subshell. In the case of helium, that's the next one. There are two total electrons. So it's in the first energy level still. The S subshell can hold 
a total of two electrons, so there's room for one more. So helium would be 1s2. When you keep going uh, further in writing an, elect an electron configuration, once you fill up one of these uh, subshells, it's full. It can't hold any more electrons. So if there are additional electrons, they need to be put in to the next higher energy level or the next higher energy space. So in the case of oxygen, there are eight total electrons. The first two can be taken care of in the first S subshell. It can hold two electrons. After that, there are six total electrons left. So going back to this, you filled up the 1s subshell. So what's next? Oh, the, you're going to the next energy level. So the second energy level and starting again with the s subshell. Energy level of two in the s subshell and you can put two more of them there. Now you've used or accounted for four of the total electrons. So you still have four more to go. Looking at the periodic table, moving, al moving right along, after in the second energy level, after the S subshell comes the P subshell, and that can hold a total of six. You had four additional electrons left, so these can all fit within the P subshell. And then you have the full uh, electron configuration for oxygen. The first two electrons go in the first energy level S orbital, lowest energy. The next highest energy area would be the second energy level, the S subshell, but that gets filled up as well. And then the second energy level in the P subshell, and that can fit a total of six, and you only have four remaining. So all of those can fit into the 2P uh, subshell, and then the electron configuration is finished. Now, as you get to larger uh, elements, particularly the D block, the transition metals. There are two weird quirks that are associated with uh, the D block um, electrons and the transition metals. The first is that even though the periodic table looks like this, where you're starting off with 3s, you move along to 3p, so it jumps down to the next highest, or jumps up to the next highest energy level, 4s. The d electrons are at a lower energy level. Even though this is how it's lined up on the periodic table, these transition metals have a lower energy level than these 4s electrons. While these 4s electrons have a higher total energy, it's easier for uh, different electrons to fill in this subshell and fill in the s subshell first before they start filling in the d subshell. So when you're starting with uh, the transition metals, so in the case of titanium right here, you go through, you filled up uh, the 2p subshell, you filled up the 2s subshell, the 3p subshell, the 4s subshell, and it goes down to 3d. And in the case of titanium, there are two electrons that would, could go in there. 4s is actually more energy overall, but uh, 3d is a little bit more difficult for the electrons to get into. So the 4s electron is filled first, and then the 3d uh, subshell. The next quirk or strange thing, or at least difficulty, with the transition metals and writing electron configurations comes in groups 
uh, 6 and 11. So these are uh, elements like chromium and that column and copper and, uh, and that column. So where this comes into play is, let's say in the case of chromium, this would be the electron configuration of chromium ending with 4s2, 3d4. The D subshell can hold a total of 10 electrons. And it's very close to being completely half filled. And that is a much more stable arrangement to have the, uh, the subshell either, either completely filled or completely half filled. And because the 4s energy uh, electrons are technically a higher energy than these 3d electrons, one of these electrons can fall back down into the 3d space. So that means that this is now the lowest energy level. Uh, the 4s electrons had a little bit higher energy and it's the 3d was really really close to being perfectly stable at half filled so one of those high energy electrons can fill back in and so now the full electron configuration for the element chromium would be 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 4s1 and 3d5, making sure that that D subshell is completely half full. The same would be true with copper, except instead of starting off with, in theory, a four, it would be a nine, very, very close to being completely filled. And so one of these high energy electrons could drop back down and fill in that gap. So when looking at electron configurations of the d orbitals, you have to keep these two things in mind that when you're starting on uh, the transition metal electrons, the energy level drops for the d subshell. And in groups 6 and 11, there is this little quirk where uh, one of the higher energy electrons would fill in the remaining part of the D subshell. The last thing about electron configurations is what happens when you have an ion. So in the case of sodium, you have a full electron configuration like this. This is the electron configuration of the sodium element. But many times, especially in uh, chemistry labs, you're not dealing with sodium element, which will explode in water. You're dealing with sodium ions, like those that are in table salt. And an ion is an element with a differing number of electrons. In the case of sodium, there is one less electrons. So which electron gets taken off? And the electron that gets taken off is the one with the highest amount of energy. So in the case of sodium, uh, the element, there is one 3s electron. This is the highest energy electron that it has. So when the sodium metal reacts and becomes sodium ion and loses an electron, it's going to lose this electron of its highest energy level. Now it's completely stable. And you'll notice when, when something is, uh, when an ion in particular is very, very stable, all of the subshells are completely filled in. Each of the S subshells has two electrons, and this P subshell has six electrons. They're completely filled. 
So this can be seen very specifically in copper and the copper, copper metal ion. So what would be expected would be having 29 electrons and with 3D9 and 4S2, but because of the quirk, copper metal actually has 4S1, 3D10. And when you have the ion, you would expect these two 4S electrons because they're, or I'm sorry, you would expect two electrons to leave this d orbital or this d subshell, but 4s is a higher energy. So what happens is there's copper ion is two plus. It loses two electrons. So the 4s electron is the highest energy. That one gets booted off. It gets lost. And the next highest energy level would be in the 3d. So this 3D10 becomes 3D9 for the copper ion. And this can work as well if you have negative anions of the nonmetals. It would just, it, they would behave just like adding in another electron. Um, so going into the next spot within the electron configuration. So this experiment kind of focuses on interactions of color and energy and light and where the electrons are in terms of their energies and what these energies actually look like and how they're described in the different electron configurations. Electron configurations are a way to show the unique pattern of energy that the electrons in an individual element would have. These electron configurations are based on the position in the periodic table. The first number in an electron configuration is the energy level of the outermost electrons. This energy level is based on where, which period the element happens to fall in. The farther down the periodic table, the higher the energy that those electrons have. The middle component of an electron configuration is the subshell. And this also is based on the periodic table. Pre-transition elements, both the alkali metals and the alkali earth metals, have an S subshell. They're only able to hold two electrons in the S subshell. The main block of elements, the post-transition elements, have a P subshell. The, the elements in the main block or the post-transition elements are able to hold six total electrons. The transition metals are in the D subshell. The D subshell is able to hold 10 total electrons. And finally, the rare earth elements here are in the F subshell, each able to hold 14 electrons. So where a, an element is, on the periodic table describes the individual electron, the last electron associated with this particular element. All of the preceding electrons also have unique individual energies associated with them, and the electron configuration can pinpoint what that unique energy is and base that on its position in the periodic table. Another way to represent uh, electrons is through an orbital diagram. These orbital diagrams are picture representations of the electron configurations themselves. Every arrow 
in an orbital diagram represents one of those electrons. As we went over, the uh, energy levels and electrons are separated into various different quantum numbers. You have the energy levels themselves, you have the subshells, and then there are the orbitals. So the energy level is that first number in the electron configuration. This is indicating what the overall energy is of those particular uh, electrons. The higher this number, the higher up in energy, the more energy those electrons have. The next is that subshell, the S, P, D, and F subshells, which each can contain uh, two, six, 10, or 14 total electrons. But within those subshells, there are also the orbitals. And depending on how large that subshell is, it can contain more orbitals, but each one only can hold two electrons. So when you're looking at uh, orbital diagrams, you're looking at all of these electrons trying to pair them up. As you're building uh, or adding more and more electrons to a particular element. You're starting with the lowest energy state, the lowest subshell in the lowest orbital, and adding in an electron, usually written as an arrow. It does not matter if it's uh, pointing in the up direction or the down direction. Either one are perfectly acceptable. But in a single orbital with two electrons, each electron is different. So to represent that difference between the two electrons, the direction of that arrow is opposite. So if the first electron you put into one of the orbitals has an up arrow, the second one would have a down arrow. If the first one was a down arrow, the second one would just be an up arrow. It doesn't matter which, uh, which way you write the arrows. So in these electron uh, orbital diagrams, you're starting off with one electron, again, at that lowest energy level, that lowest orbital. So just uh, like with hydrogen, with helium, there's two electrons. So you first would write that up arrow in that lowest energy state, that lowest orbital, and then complete the orbital with the down arrow, two total electrons. As you get to larger and larger elements with more and more electrons, they're going to completely fill the first energy level, that 1s uh, orbital, they'll also completely fill the 2s orbital. And notice how they're written. Uh, while many times you can just write them as a straight line, uh, other times they are written vertically like this with the lowest energy orbital on the bottom and each subsequent orbital or subshell as it's increasing in temp uh, in energy is higher up on the orbital diagram. So once you get uh, out of that s orbital, there's again each s orbital only can hold two electrons, but once you get beyond those into the p subshell or into the d subshell, these can hold multiple electrons and they have multiple orbitals. Each one can only hold two. So in the case of boron, you have the electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. There is one electron contained in that p subshell. So you can write the one arrow in one of those orbitals. When you move uh, to the element next to boron, carbon, it ends as 2p2. There are two electrons in 
the P subshell. And when you're filling up a subshell, these are all at equivalent energies. You're not uh, filling it up in one whole orbital and then the next, you'll go through and half fill the, or the entire subshell in one direction and then continue on in the opposite direction. So with uh, carbon, that 2p2 electron goes in the next orbital with the same direction. In nitrogen, the 2p3 uh, orbital, all three of those electrons are in separate orbitals all in the same direction. But now at this point, the p subshell is completely half filled. All three of its orbitals have one electron all in the same orientation. So one more electron would now start the opposite uh, arrow direction, that spin number, that spin quantum number. And it would continue um, continue on. So fluorine would have another arrow here, and then um, neon would have another arrow there, both pointing down until the entire subshell is filled. This would also continue on into the D subshell with five total orbitals, uh, for a total of 10 electrons, all five of those d orbitals would be half filled first before the next electron is placed in the orbital. In the lab experiment itself, this quantum properties lab is a number of smaller mini experiments all combined under the same theme of the quantum properties of these elements and the periodic table. The first part of this, or the first one of these mini experiments, is relating color and light. You're going to be using the spectrophotometers in the lab and changing the wavelength of light. You're going to dial the wavelength of light using this knob on the top, and you're looking inside to what color is that light. So the electromagnetic spectrum is separated into these different areas depending on the wavelength of that light, the energy of that light. And these different areas of light can interact with molecules in different ways. So uh, X-rays are very, very high energy uh, wavelengths of light, and you're looking at inner electron uh, energy transitions. In the ultraviolet UV and the visible region, you're looking at uh, outer electron energy transitions. If you get to lower energies, of light, you can just look at the frequency of how bonds vibrate. And even lower, you can see the frequency of how molecules rotate amongst themselves. But the visible region of light, this is the area of the electromagnetic spectrum that you can see. And this area focuses on the energy uh, transitions of those outer electrons, or some of them. So what you're going to be relating is when you see a color, how does that relate to its overall energy? So you're going to be looking at the different wavelengths of light going from 400 to 700 nanometers. You're going to change the wavelength and look inside this test tube that's placed in the spectrophotometer, you're going to look inside that and see the color of light. So you can relate as you're changing the uh, wavelength, what is happening to the visible color that you can see. To look at the relationship between light and color, you're going to be using the spectrophotometer. At least one of the spectrophotometers in the room will be set up with a large test tube with a white piece of paper in it. 
you're going to look at all of the wavelengths in increments of 10 through the full visible region of the spectrum. You can adjust the wavelength using the knob on the top of the spectrophotometer. Once the wavelength is adjusted, you can look inside the test tube and see what color is the light that's shining on the white piece of paper. You can then relate that to the different wavelengths and therefore the different energy of light that is associated with the different colors. So once you have uh, those colors recorded from the lab. The lab report itself in this section is a number of different calculations. It's really just different conversions. You have the color of that different wavelength of light recorded uh, from the lab itself, but the wavelength is given to you in nanometers for all of the points that you're looking at you're going to be converting that wavelength into uh, from nanometers into meters. Then you'll convert the wavelength into a frequency by using the speed of light and convert that frequency into an energy using Planck's constant. So as you go through and look at this, you should be able to see what color is associated with higher energy, what color is associated with lower energy. And you'll use those relationships in some of these other parts of the experiment, looking at as you see a color of energy, is that high energy or low energy? What would be the trends of that energy really just looking at color? The next uh, mini experiment in this lab is looking at the flame test. And this is where you'll have a number of solutions in a, a, in a spray bottle. So you'll have solutions of different metal ions and those are going to be sprayed into a burner. You're burning the metals. And as those metals are burning in an intense flame, they're absorbing all of that energy and then releasing it in the form of a photon. And the specific color of those different um, photons, that specific color of light is related to the energy of the actual uh, metal ion itself. The flame test is a qualitative experiment used to identify different elements. These elements all have different and unique energies associated with them based on the energy of the different valence electrons or the electrons in their hot, the most active energy level, those outside electrons. And by summing the different energies of all of those electrons, the different elements give unique colors. Something like sodium gives a bright orange flash, very typical of when you're burning wood or something else. Other elements can give other intense colors, such as lithium with a bright red flame or copper with an orange, uh, with a bluish green or almost teal flame color. These individual flame colors are specific and unique to the different elements. If you were to look and separate the individual colors, you would be able to see a pattern associated with the different elements that is based on the energies of its electrons and resulting in the color that you can see in the flame test. So when you perform this flame test, you're going to be igniting uh, the Bunsen burner. Your instructor can help you with that if you're having a little difficulty. You are using a 
relatively large open flame. So please be sure that any loose clothing uh, is pinned down or any hair or, or head coverings are tied back uh, just as, uh, as a safety precaution. You're going to be spraying uh, solutions of lithium, sodium, potassium, calcium, copper, strontium, and barium chloride into the flame and recording these uh, different colors. You'll look at those colors and using the previous mini experiment, that color and light, you'll generally relate how the energy changes for at least the alkali metals as, a, as its position on the periodic table moves. For each one of these ions, you're going to be listing the electron configuration. So remember, these are all ions, so they're all missing some electrons. The alkali metals here are only missing one electron, and then the rest of them are all missing two electrons. So be sure when you're recording those electron configurations, you take into account that they are missing a few of those highest energy electrons. The next mini experiment you're looking at is the hydrogen line spectrum. In the lab, you're going to be using the spectroscopes provided to look at an emission spectrum of both hydrogen and mercury. In the next quantum section, you're going to be looking at the emission spectrum of both hydrogen and mercury. In the experiment, you'll use a spectroscope to obtain the emission spectrum of these two light sources. You'll look through the viewing port, and you're looking at this intense color in the middle of the two discharge tubes. As you do this, you'll be able to see at least three out of the four emission lines. You're going to use the emission lines of the hydrogen lamp to prepare a calibration graph. You'll graph what you measure from hydrogen on the x-axis versus the known Balmer series on the y-axis. Using those three to four data points, you can develop the equation of a straight line where the y values are the correct values and the x values are the measured values. You can then use that line to determine the correct values for mercury. You will take your measured mercury values plot the, and plug them into your equation for x and solve for the y value of the correct mercury lines. So the emission spectrum should look something like this. Uh, the spectroscopes might be reversed but you're looking to see where are these intense lines of different colors along the spectroscope scale. Now in the spectroscopes in lab, it's listed as uh, values of four, five, six, and seven. Those are 400, 500, 600, 700 nanometers. When you're measuring that in the lab itself, these are measured values and they're going to be relatively inaccurate. But this particular emission spectrum of the hydrogen lines is very well known and very well understood. And in the visible region, this is the Balmer series. As the electrons are relaxing back down to an N equals two state, and releasing these quantized uh, amounts of energy as these different light uh, photons, these different colors. So if you know what the correct values should be, you're going to create a graph of 
the Balmer series versus what you measure through the spectroscope. So the value you measure on the spectroscope will be on the x-axis where the correct values, these Balmer series will be on the y-axis. It should be a relative straight line, not the greatest, uh, but you're going to be, be creating this calibration graph where the true value is equal to the slope of your line times the, your measured value plus the y-intercept of your line. This is a calibration plot of the spectroscope itself, not of the hydrogen. It's a calibration of the spectroscope you were holding in your hand to measure these values. Once you have this slope and intercept of, uh, from your graph, you can use that to look at the mercury lines. In the lab itself, you're going to be measuring these mercury lines as well, and then use your equation to determine the correct value. In this case, if I had a measured mercury line of 590 nanometers, and this is my calibration graph, I have a slope of 0.8581, and an intercept of 46.013. So if I put in 590 nanometers as my measured value and multiply it by the slope, add the intercept, I get the correct true value as 552.5 nanometers. Both the hydrogen lamps and the mercury should give four different lines. But uh, in both cases, one line is going to be very, very close to the ultraviolet region. So you might not be able to see uh, the very last line, but you should be able to see three different lines for both the hydrogen spectrum and the mercury spectrum. The last mini experiment that you're going to be doing in lab that relates to the quantum properties is looking at paramagnetism. While many things uh, are ferromagnetic, meaning related to iron, something that is paramagnetic is related to the unpaired electrons. Something that has unpaired electrons in that uh, in its orbital diagram will be attracted to a very strong magnetic field. And something with more unpaired electrons will have a stronger interaction with uh, magnets themselves. So in the experiment, you're going to be looking at four different ions and how those ions interact with very strong neodymium magnets. You're looking at calcium, manganese, cobalt, and copper ions. These solutions are in ethanol. And you'll take that and see what your observations are as you have these liquids interact with the strong magnet. And looking at those observations, which ones are drawn to the magnet and then after you write the full orbital diagram for each one of these different ions, determine what ones are actually paramagnetic and explain what the differences are between your observations and the paramagnetic ions through the orbital diagrams. In the paramagnetic setup, you'll be looking at ions of calcium, manganese, cobalt, and copper, and seeing how they interact with a very strong neodymium magnet. For each solution, you'll place the test tube on its side and see how the magnet interacts with the solution. Look at the air bubble and the liquid level itself. And write down your observations of what happens when the magnet comes close to the solution. 
which ones are drawn to the powerful magnet and would be considered paramagnetic and what relationship there is between the solution and the magnet. The other part that you're going to be doing in the lab is an activity related to the periodic table, a periodic table scavenger hunt. In the lab, there are going to be a number of larger printed out uh, periodic tables, each displaying some sort of different properties, and they're relatively color coded. So in this example here, this is uh, a periodic table of electronegativity. This one here is on the year it was discovered. So you're going to be given uh, a sheet of about approximately 25 different questions that you'll be completing in the lab and passing in before you leave. So the different uh, properties that are around in the form of different periodic tables are the year that the element was discovered, its boiling point, its melting point, its electronegativity, its density, its atomic radius, different isotopic masses, and a periodic table of images. What does that pure element actually look like? So the questions are set up in a form like this. What is the electronegativity of the alkaline earth metal discovered in 1808? So in each case, you're looking to see what information is provided in the question itself. You're provided that it is uh, an alkaline earth metal and that it was discovered in 1808. The question is asking about the electronegativity. In all of these uh, questions, you'll need to know what is the actual element first? That's all of these are a two, at least a two step question. Uh, in the first case, you need to f figure out what is that element? So it gives you that it is an alkaline earth metal. So you would look on the periodic table in the alkaline earth metals. You at least get it narrowed down to a specific area. It also gives you the information that it was discovered in 1808. So looking at the uh, year discovered periodic table in the alkaline earth metals, you only have so many choices and you find that barium was discovered in 1808. So the identity of the element itself is barium. But the question asks for electronegativity. So now that you know the element itself, you can look at the periodic table of electronegativity and look at the electronegativity of the element barium. And from that, you can determine the electronegativity value is 0 0.89. So you'll work through these uh, in your uh, in pairs and determine the uh, identities of these 25 different elements or the answers to these varying different questions and uh, roam around the room looking at these different periodic tables and you'll pass that in uh, before you leave and that will be a part of the lab report grade itself. The rest of it, the uh, all of the quantum properties and all of the calculation-based uh, questions would be due the following week as uh, the lab report. So overall, in this experiment, there's a number of different mini experiments that are not quite large enough for a full uh, full for a full college lab, but combined together all relate to the periodic table and the different energy and electrons of the elements. You're looking at relating the different colors to different energy levels. So looking at colors of light through the visible region, 400 to 700 nanometers, and converting those values into an energy 
and seeing which color has a higher energy associated with it. You're going to be using those colors and that relationship in the flame test, you're going to be looking at lithium, sodium, potassium, calcium, copper, strontium, and barium ions, and seeing what are the colors associated with the flame test um, and relating that to relative energy and also looking at the electron configuration of these different ions. You'll be uh, obtaining the hydrogen line spectrum and mercury. You're going to be looking through a spectroscope, recording down what are the measured values of both hydrogen and mercury from your spectroscope. You'll uh, prepare a graph of your measured hydrogen values on the x-axis versus the measured uh, or versus the known values on the y-axis, the Balmer series. You'll develop an equation for that line and then use that equation and your measured mercury values to calculate the correct values. What is the corrected value for those three or four mercury lines? In, uh, the fourth one, looking at paramagnetism. You're looking at calcium, cobalt, copper, and manganese, looking at how very strong magnets interact with those ions and seeing one from just your observations, which ones appear to be drawn to the magnet and are paramagnetic. And then looking at those four um, orbital diagrams, which ones are actually paramagnetic and be able to explain why so there would be any differences between them. And also utilizing the varying periodic tables throughout the lab in order to answer uh, different questions about the compounds, the elements, and their different properties.